Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're here with another lockdown presentation from a uh, fantastic uh, photographer, Martin Osner. He's um, uh, going to present some fine art photography for us. Now, you know, fine art photography is, um, you know, can sometimes have quite a strange, uh, you know, well, not strange, but a, a connotation which you can't really sort of put your, your finger on. So, um, you know, do you need a, a rock? And some water and it's quite still and there's a branch waving in the background you know there's there's like this hidden uh, uh you know mystique of of the fine art photographers <laughs> i'm hoping that we can get a little bit of uh, a little bit of clarity and direction certainly for for me um and then um yeah we'll we'll see what uh, what you have to say uh, martin over to you welcome what, what have you been doing while the the lockdown period has been in place cleaning cleaning and cleaning just so much stuff to do so uh, yeah, yeah. I, said the, I said God had to shut down the whole world so that I could get my stuff done. <laughs> wow. I okay. So uh, I think if you keep yourself busy, it actually takes your mind off things and it's much easier. So, yeah, that's what we have to Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 for my sins, decided to start a photographic Facebook group and that certainly kept, uh, kept me busy. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's fantastic. Great idea. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so um, over to you. Let us uh, let's take us through your, your journey, and um, we'd love to hear from you. All right, and I think it's uh, and thanks for the invite. I I appreciate it very much, and and uh, I, I was asked this morning um, by my daughter, my nervous to do this talk, and uh, I said to her, you know what, it's actually worse than than having to speak to a large group. I think with a large group, there's interaction. You can at least you know, get some energy from people and that. But when you're talking to a computer, uh, luckily I'm, I'm speaking to you, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. But I've put together a, a presentation, hopefully that will answer your question. What is fine art photography? It's impossible to define. So I think somebody said to me one day, it's just an excuse for bad photography. So, <laughs> so you can hide behind that. It's an excuse for out of focus <laughs> photography. <huh? laughs> and everything else. I think everything goes, even the landscape can be left on. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so I've got a little presentation I'd like to take us through. Um, there's two parts to the presentation. The first part, I want to just take you through a little bit of history, uh, certainly um, uh, with myself. Um, may I introduce my daughter quickly because she's part of this journey? Absolutely. You know, Sam. Um, Sam joined me a few years ago. Say hello to everybody. Wag like a telly tubby. <laughs> <laughs> So Sam is, a, Sam is also here just to double check that dad doesn't push the wrong button. So oh, she, she's, uh, the, she's the, in the background. The technology uh, expert, huh? Hey? She's the technology <laughs> expert. All right. Okay, cool. So there's two parts to this, uh, to, the, to the little presentation. The first part is a journey. I, I, I think in order to get to what I really want to discuss today with what is fine art photography, um, and maybe give some examples and show some work, and explain some of the procedures and, and behind it. The first part is a journey. It's a, this is a lifetime, a lifetime journey. There's, you know, there's, this doesn't seem to be a destination in place and it's been a walk for, for many, many years. But to understand where I'm going, I need to do that. So I'm going to take us through a quick look at that. And I'm going to try you know, to finish the second session with maybe a good 15, 20 minutes. And hopefully we can invite questions because that's normally where the good stuff comes from. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, right. everyone that's watching this, um, please make sure that you've got questions. Uh, yeah, we, we, we've got a, we've got a I just, just want to say, if I may, I just want to say questions we will not be entertaining is what camera do you use? Oh. Yeah, because that doesn't really matter in this line of work. And, and what and, are your and settings? And another question is, yes, is, does fine art photography sell? The answer is yes, so I'm going to answer that right up front. Fantastic. But just really, okay. okay. So can I share my screen yes, with you and we can get started? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so the world of fine art photography, and, and as we've said, it's a very difficult thing to define. Um, but hopefully some of the things we will deal with today will perhaps help to, to get folk to understand a little bit about the world that certainly myself and my daughter are living in. So, um, Sorry, I just want to see why the presentation is not moving on. Sorry, Quentin, this is... I don't know why it's, uh, it doesn't want to go. Uh, there we go. There we go. I just got to use the keyboard. All right. Okay. So, 
The journey for me uh, started back in 1981. That's a long time ago, as you can appreciate. And photography and I met quite like by accident. I was, uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. It was just after coming out of school. Um, I'm the world's worst student. Uh, luckily, I can teach a little bit, but I'm the world's worst student. And, and the journey started there. And there's a long story behind this, but we wouldn't have time today. In 1982 to 1984, I served as a, as a Navy photographer for the reconnaissance forces during military subscription. And that's really where I got to learn about the basics of photography. I think in many cases, what I learned is, is how not to do things. But it, it formed a really clean um, and solid foundation for me to build off. In 1985, when I, I was released from the subscription, I, um, I opened up my first photographic studio in Johannesburg. It was a commercial photography studio, but it, it, uh, it was more for portraiture. So again, that taught me lessons and, uh, and it started the foundation of where we are today, especially when it comes to photographing public and photographing uh, what the public requires and not necessarily what you want. In 1987 was a very big year for me. That was the year I got married, married to a lovely woman, Anita. And together we've had three children, one of them being Samantha, and uh, they've stood by me right through this whole journey, which is admirable. Um, in 1983, um, and just prior to, to being married, I was involved uh, in a photographic retail business. So uh, you may remember uh, the, uh, the, the company Etkins, Etkins yes. Photographic. Yes. And uh, yeah, so I, I had a small share in a, in a larger concern, and I started off uh, with that on the sideline as well. Something that I actually didn't enjoy at all. Be behind the camera was my love, not having to import cameras to sell them. So uh, that was by the way. But in 1993, with uh, a gentleman by the name of Bob Wee, he was my business partner at that stage, we opened the National College of Photography in Pretoria. I don't know if you're familiar with the brand, uh, yes, but it I was a private photographic college. And we started in 1993 just teaching part-time photography. And that was quite exciting. And um, at the same time, or just two years later, I opened a commercial photography studio in, uh, in Pretoria. That was called Studio 7. And there I dealt with full commercial work. So anything from cars to, to whatever came through the door, all commercial work. And I'll show a little bit of this in a moment. The college in 1997 started a full-time one-year diploma and it was, it, it, there was such an appetite for people to learn. And you remember that this, these were the days just before the internet. So there wasn't YouTube and, 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 and resources people could go to. You actually had to go and physically learn and, and lock yourself away for a while to do so. So we started a one-year program which was also very successful. And then in 2004, um, actually just before that, somebody else I want to mention, there was a a young man who came into the classes, his name is Dirk Bossoff. He turned up around about 1999, 1998, I'm not sure exactly. And he was one of my students and turned out to be one of the most talented people in photography I'd ever met. Needless to say, he just never left. And in 2004, um, he came on board as, as, a, as a junior partner into the company and, uh, and just offered so much to where we were going. Um, there was another youngster uh, at that stage, Eugene van der who also came in. He today is, uh, he teaches at the Cape Town School of Photography. He's their senior lecturer there. So this program continued and in 2004, we opened up uh, East Rand Campus in Bedford View. And we also extended the program. We extended it to, um, to an extra six months. And at the same time, we franchised the campus to Saxon World. So this was before the Gupta dates, right? And uh, I think we came first, they came second, and uh, we franchised the campus uh, in Saxon World, and uh, Udo and David, who were also students of mine prior, did a fantastic job in opening up a, a new part-time photography business, which later became full-time. Is, is that where this should be in was? was. <laughs> that is where this should be, yeah, <laughs> not was. <laughs> in 2007, 2008, the college was sold. So, we had a, an offer from Advitec to purchase the college into their Vega brand and we decided that we would sell and, uh, 
and that was a chapter of my life that you know was was exciting but it did come to an end at the same time Udo and David who a lot of people know um, at the digital school of photography well they rebranded and they still continuing well today uh, Udo is still continuing today as we speak so in 2009 I moved to Hout Bay um, I closed up everything in Pretoria Joburg and I ran to the Cape I did I did this particularly to to look at opening up a fine art photography gallery which I somehow knew in Pretoria at 2009 was not ready for photography as an art medium and uh, Joburg was also actually not ready so you know Cape Town has got a much nicer um, international audience both the swallows who live here uh, for the summer and then go back for the summer from Europe and, and a lot of international visitors so I decided that I would move down to the Cape and look at opening up um, a gallery. And then in 2010, um, I opened the gallery in Greenpoint, which is, uh, which is quite a nice area of Cape Town. And we started trading as the Martin Osner Fine Art Gallery. In 2012, uh, I also opened up a private photography school in Hart Bay. This was in a need to continue teaching. I had a four year restraint of trade with Advertex, so I couldn't teach up until then. And I felt that I needed to continue teaching. So I specifically opened up a, a, a small private little school, but just for hobbyists, not for full time uh, training. Um, and that has proved to be very, uh, very successful and still continues today. The gallery expanded and uh, was rebranded in 2016. It was rebranded to the Art Photography Gallery and we moved to a new location, double the size and uh, double the energy. And, uh, and that's where we currently are at the moment. Uh, in 2018, I opened up a private gallery and that I opened up at home. And I'll show you pictures just now of what it looks like and all that sort of stuff. And this particularly, I, I did this because at the Art Photography Gallery, um, we were representing a number of really good talents and I was battling to separate myself on the wall. So I knew I, I needed to have a dedicated space. So I created a space uh, on our property at, uh, at home. We had a guest house, I closed that down and we opened the gallery. And at that stage, I got a call from Chris van der Linde, a good friend of mine who, who I, I, I trust immensely. And he said to me, I need to share the space with my daughter because her work is amazing and if I don't open the door, it's going to get kicked down whether I like it or not. He also felt that she brought a feminine touch to my, my personal space. So I took his advice and it's been a wonderful success. And again, I'll show you pictures in a moment. Now in 2020, we're relocating the Art Photography Gallery now to Woodstock. Uh, we're going over to a new area. The gallery is going to be bigger again and Boulder, we're in the jaws of COVID-19, so who knows how long this is going to take to roll out, but we're in the process of actually reopening the new space. So that's really been my journey so far. And I think it's important that, that I, I put that out there because the, the first, what, 1982, 2004, that's 24 years, I dedicated my career to the pursuit of excellence in the photography. Uh, arena, both in photographing as well as in teaching. Everything was about technical, 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 technical perfection. Um, I realized that one day when somebody asked Dirk Borsoff, who I mentioned, about Martin Osner's work and how would you know it's his, and he said, and I, I was eavesdropping, and he said, you will see there's not one fault in it. And although that seems like a compliment, it was actually a warning that I was going the wrong way. And, uh, and you will understand that in a moment. So in 2004, up until that point, everything was about pursuing absolute excellence, correct exposure, perfect processing in the darkroom, and at that stage, obviously, the first throws of digital, uh, grain noise had to be perfect, color had to be absolutely perfect, and corrected distortion had to be taken care of, whether you used the shift lens or later whether you used, were able to use software. All of this had to happen. My world was completely and utterly saturated in technical photography. And even composition, working with ad agencies, clients, you would know this. 
Uh, even composition was something that was compromised by end usage. So either you were told how it needed to be composed or you were shown where the text was going to go so that you could make composition around text and design. So I just the bane of uh, the bane of photographers' lives, hey? The, the art director, creative director, <laughs> and the executive creative director. Exactly. Exactly. So I mean you would understand that. And and I just want to make this clear. In this time of technical photography and technical pursuit of of of, of correct photography, I loved every minute of it. It was not that this, that this was something I didn't want to do. I absolutely loved it. I loved doing it and I loved showing it. And I also had a policy in place that, that nobody would stand up and teach unless they were actively involved in the photography industry. And, and that policy did well for us. Unfortunately, in the, in the throes of, of corporate uh, environment, that doesn't, that doesn't work anymore, but it certainly worked for us. So, I had to remain active with clients and then I could take that knowledge over and I could teach. So I'm just going to throw a few little pictures up so that you can actually see. So it's, it's really mundane subjects just photographed in, a, in, in, a, in beautiful lighting to create a beautiful impression. So whatever it was, this is the type of photography that I was involved in and especially so for clients and for brief work. I would do anything from fashion, glamour, jewellery photography, um, in those days, we had, we had no digital, so uh, something like a shadow like this had to be built on an infinity curve and lit correctly because it's just to go and, and even try it on digital was not an option. Um, I did some work for, for uh, the car manufacturers, so it was the first of the TT Roadsters that came out. This was the first of BMWs, Z3s. This was the type of work I was into. And again, I stress, I stress the point. I, absolutely loved it. It, it wasn't, it, it, it was something I really, really enjoyed. And then something changed. And it was, it was around about 2004, 2005. The Professional Photographers Association at that stage were very involved with the teaching of the Photography College. And at one of our brief briefings or boardroom meetings, it was suggested that we added a further six months to our program because our portfolios were looking too technical. They were good, but they didn't have heart and soul. So it was, it was considered that we would introduce a marketing module and we would also introduce a creative module. And, uh, and nobody, at that stage we had a number of lecturers, nobody put their hand up to teach this. And secretly, I was dabbling in fine art photography behind closed doors. And uh, I had a sense that something was brewing here. So I put up my hand and said, I will take it. And I was afforded some nice time to be able to, to practice these techniques. And then there's nothing like teaching. Teaching is, that's where you learn. You learn from your students, you learn from their, their successes and their mistakes. And suddenly this world started to get unpacked, which, which I was ready for, but still didn't really understand. At the same at the time, we started to see that photography was, was, was sort of finding its way into international art fairs. Galleries overseas were starting to keep photography as an alternative. And certainly some galleries were, were opening that were only dealing with photography. And this was so exciting. That, uh, you know, we, we down in South Africa, a little bit further away from the rest of the world. But this was starting to happen and it was starting to become a manifestation of the fact that, that what we were trying to pursue was indeed correct. So I started to play around with all kinds of techniques where, where photography was used as part of a process. Paper tolling, hand painting of black and white photographs, uh, transfers of all sorts from Polaroids through to ink transfers and gel transfers and whatever would transfer. And then using photography with 3D overlays and all of this some of these techniques I've developed recently, but for a lot of them were, were built up over this period of time. And then the sale, of course, of the gallery, uh, of, the, of the business, and then the, the gallery started to demand that this type of work was part of what we offered. And then this friend of mine, Chris van der Lende, this wonderful chap who came in and told me that my daughter needs to take half my wall space. Um, he walked in one day, and I think this was the turning point for me. 
He walked in one day and he walked into my office and he said to me, they've got it. And I said, what do you mean they've got it? Now, of course, as a, as a purist landscape photographer, he works purely on photographic film, even today, you may know him. And, uh, and his opinion is so truthful and so direct. And he walked in and he said, they've got it. And he laid down an inkjet print that he had, had made. And when I saw the print and I touched the paper, I just knew something is happening. And uh, at that stage, color photography could not be collected because it only lasted, what you would know, 10 years, 15 years, and then the color would fade. And he put on the inkjet print and I said, yeah, but how long? And he said to me, 120, 130 years before there's any, any obvious fading. And I just knew it. This is what photography needs. It needs something that people can buy into as a collectible for years and years and years to come. He asked me at that stage if I would help him with his first exhibition. So the two pictures you see here, we solarized in the, in the dark room and then we scanned them and then we printed them out onto, um, onto the, the paper. I think it was either the, the Hahnemühle German etching, if I remember correctly, which was the first paper we managed to get hold of and had an absolutely unbelievable exhibition. And still today we talk about this moment. And that was the moment for me that I think everything started to happen. So that's a brief history of where we are as of today. And, and the rest of the presentation, I want to maybe try to define what is fine art photography and, and why is it that fine art photography um, is so prevalent today and, and yeah, why it's so difficult to actually um, to define or, or, or to put in a box. So I don't know if you have any questions at this stage or should we just uh, continue? Yeah, I think we can just continue. I'm just about to ask if they've got any questions there, but I think we can continue. All right, cool. So the world of fine art photography. Now what you see on the screen over here is, the, is basically the opinion of Martin. So what did I say that, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah this, is, this is what, I would, or how I would probably try to summarize it to most people to make it a little bit more understandable. On the left, you have photography. Now, photography can be part of fine art because, because you can shoot a photograph and you can print a photograph and you can put it on a wall and you can sell it. So it certainly doesn't require other processes. So photography on its own is on the left-hand side. And, but generally speaking, photography is the art of recording um, a reality, image with the use of a camera onto a light sensitive medium. Art photography, I think is different. Art photography for me is more um, art that you will show, but its end purpose is more to do with interior decor and design. So it doesn't deliver messages. It's not necessarily addition type work, but it forms a place where it can be used. Like for example, in hotel foyers, hotels, or or places, public spaces like that, or in a person's home as a decorative piece. But fine art photography is different. Fine art photography for me is, is more where the artist's emotions and messages are part of the artwork. It's where, you know, art has always been there to question society. And I think fine art photography does exactly that. So it's used more in that sense. If you go on to Wikipedia, the great Wikipedia, and you look at Wikipedia, I've taken this a copy and pasted it straight out of Wikipedia. So this is what it says. Fine art photography is created primarily as an expression of the artist's vision. So it's nothing that somebody commissions you to do, it's something that you commission yourself to do. So every amateur can be a fine art photographer. What's most important is that the artist's vision is shown, whether it's a message, whether you're trying to tell people something, whether you're sharing something with somebody, whatever it is that is important. Wikipedia goes on to say that the goal of fine art photography is to express an idea, a message or an emotion. And then it goes on to say simply capturing what one sees as an artist, or sorry, what one sees in an artistic way is the, is the art of photography and is not creating fine art. So there's a big definition difference over here. And again, it is a gray area but it is an important thing to note. So almost, if you want to just take the word fine out and replace it with the word bespoke. So it, uh, there's more meaning behind it. 
is photography really an art form? Well, that's one of the questions I didn't want today because the answer is undoubtedly yes, especially in the era that we're living in. It is an absolute force to be reckoned with. It is the new kid on the block and it has taken its rightful place into the world of art, bullied its way into the rightful, its rightful place into the world of art. Go back to the great artists like Paul Cezanne. If you look, he used photography as, as an inspirational form to be able to paint from. So even photography in its humblest forms has played a role in the world of art, even if it's just helping the artist to get to, a, to, get to an outcome. Vincent van Gogh, I mean, if you look at his work, you would see that he also used photography as a form to be able to paint from. And if you look at what Picasso said, I mean, uh, he said, I've always been very interested in photography and I've looked at far more photographs than I have paintings. <laughs> That's an admission from the greatest artist that probably walked this planet. And because the, he said it's because the reality is stronger than reality itself. Such a strong statement. And yet we undermine it today. Yeah, we sit today and we question it. We shouldn't be questioning it. We should be embracing it. The period of modern Modern art, this is a very interesting point. So modern art itself, let's say nine, uh, 1860 through to 1970. So you, you, you're looking at what, 100 odd years here. And in that 100 odd years, all of these art movements were founded, right through from Impressionism all the way through to pop art. And what I find fascinating is every single one of them was met uh, by the public um, where they questioned the essence of what the artists were trying to do. They were challenged and they were, in many cases, made out to be lunatics and imbeciles as an artist. And yet today it's what we really love. I'm not going to make a statement which is, which is my opinion, but I, I truly believe photography is going through what modern art went through in this period we're busy going through at the moment. I can only imagine that in 20, 30 years from now, people will be looking back and say, check at this work these guys have been doing on a program called Photoshop. It was so antiquated. But look at what they did. Yes, it's not perfect, but oh my God, look at how, how creative they were by putting a, an elephant in a tree and, and creating these wonderful uh, art impressions and look at the skill that these surrealists had. I think, you know, it will be appreciated more by the future generations than we appreciate it today. Photoshop is seen as a, as a liar, as a, as a tool that, that, is, uh, that imposes on humankind. And yet it's a, it is a wonderful tool among many. So what does photography bring to art? I'm gonna go through these quickly, but this is, this is the camera itself, the camera and the photographic process. Now, I'll make another statement. I want to, what I'd like to say is that if you are interested in art photography, and if you start by sitting down and reading through the instruction booklet by the, by the manufacturer and following it step by step, and then implementing it as per the book, you will be on the complete opposite side of fine art photography. Your work will be predictable. You'll become what I call a chocolate box photographer. It may be pretty, but it'll have no emotion. So if you look at what does photography bring to the world of art, well, it has a limited dynamic range, which you would know compared to human vision in contrast. These are all the errors of photography. Photographs can be dramatically altered using depth of field. Long lenses give you compression. You can bring that to the world of photography. Wide angle lenses give you distortion and art is all about distortion. So you can use that, you know, you get told in the book not to use a wide angle lens close up, you'll distort. In art photography, you get told if you step back, you're in trouble. Point of focus can be changed at will and it doesn't have to be in focus. Strong angles create parallax shifts, which is great in the world of, of, of art photography. Your shutter speeds can freeze and blur to bring emotions back to the pictures. Color cast can be altered with white balance, no problem at all. And incorrect color, by the way, not just correct color. And ISO, that influences your texture. So sensitive ISOs, ISOs are considered a, a great medium for art photography. Your multiple exposures, both in camera and on Photoshop and HDR and ghosting and misalignments 
that's all part of it. As well as post-production and video edit, uh, not video, and editing software, plus, of course, the old darkroom days. If you add all of that up together, you, photography is a reality-based medium, but it is not perfect. Many people pursue it because they want it to be perfect. Does that make sense? I mean, that's what I did for so many years. I wanted to take what was out in reality and I wanted to, to look exactly like the way I was seeing it or better. But I didn't want to go and make it look crazy because that would have just been a sin. But in the world I'm in today, it's completely and utterly the opposite. So photography is a reality-based medium and it's not perfect. And that's the embrace. That wonderful saying that says I photograph things. Why? Because I love to see how things look once photographed. Sounds so silly and yet this is the heart of it. Making things look different once photographed. So using the photographic process, how can it be suited for fine art photography? Now the purists out there, you better put on your seatbelts because uh, I think this may, uh, this may come as a little bit of a test. But art and the world of, of art, whether it's with photography or art per se, distortion and deconstruction is part of it. It's one of the starting points and it's part of it. Well, in photography, if you bring the camera to it, poor quality lenses and pinhole photography can be used. High ISO ratings can be used. Ink and heat transfer where you can transfer the ink from a medium onto a medium can be used. Texture overlays can be used. Solarization brought in from the darkroom can be used in the modern uh, digital world. Multiple exposures in and out of camera. Collaging, montaging, hand embellishing prints uh, with paint, charcoal and pastels can be used. Photoshop can be used and editing apps can be used. And yes, of course, smartphone photography is part of what we do. It cannot be an, uh, uh, ignored. I was doing a talk the other day and I asked uh, a whole group of people at a convention, how many of you are prepared to put up your hands and say that you actually use your mobile photography in your, in your world of correct or digital SLR and mirrorless photography? And very, very few of them put up their hands because the rest are embarrassed. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. There's a world that lies in smartphone uh, and digital photography. So I'm going to go on to some photographs and I'm going to just tell you a few little stories behind some of these and, and maybe try to give you some idea where the, uh, you know, with the art photography and where that all comes from. Um, I've taken a cross section of some of the work. So there's a little bit of everything. There's not many, but let's go through them and then we can summarize and then we'll start to take questions if you have any. This was the very first, uh, very first photograph I took in the world of art photography. At this stage, um, I realized that the studio was my problem. And in trying to get into the world of art photography, I kept going back to the studio trying to control things because I knew I could. And it got to a point one day when I realized I couldn't serve a technically correct medium or, or audience and then do an art or, uh, and then create art the very next day. So I took a, a very bold decision to close down the studio. I sold a lot of the equipment. I gave a whole lot of the equipment away and I handed all my commercial clients over to my trusty assistant, Martin Short, who used to help me out at that stage. And I walked away with very little equipment because I realized that was the problem. This photograph I took forms part of my abandoned series that's done very well for me in fact it's been exhibited um, throughout the world and it is as grainy as anything but it's got mood and it's got emotion it started off a series called the abandoned series so these are all thrown away old things that are basically reincarnated in their beauty um, an old airplane that i found on a military base in uh, in cape town uh, it was quite strange with this particular photograph we we went in to go and shoot it because i a friend of mine told me about a, a, an airplane in the trees but he said you will find an old airplane in the trees but he didn't say it was among the trees so we drove up and down this one area in the Karoo looking for it never found it and one day i spotted it it turned out to be a military base and and we got escorted 
out of the property with a couple of Bedfords and a whole lot of army guys. It was, it was quite surreal. And eventually the officer commanding after I pursued him over and over and over gave me permission to go back and re-photograph this airplane. So I included things like old aircraft hangers in a storm um, and old petrol pumps that were just standing and waiting. This all was part of a, a complete series of the abandoned collection, which I've now, after 13, 14 odd years, I've actually stopped shooting for this. And I've closed off the series and we, we are finalizing a coffee table book for this at the moment. Um, but I think if you look at these, what, what is important to understand here is that for this type of photography, the camera has been used pretty much on its own. The only thing that's been thrown into it is HDR, high dynamic range, and used in this case technically correct, so we could reduce the contrast uh, between highlight and shadow and, uh, and be able to create a slightly more um, ethereal look to the actual pictures, but nothing more than that. Here's a a better example of using what the camera does incorrectly as part of the world of art photography. This is a collection called Downtown, and here in camera HDR has been used, but incorrectly. The, the manufacturer tells you if you want to use HDR in your camera, put your camera on a tripod, make sure there's no subject movement. So what happens if you handhold it and you allow your subject to move? Well, if you time it correctly, if you look down at the, at the um, pants of the chap with the with a red top, it starts to create a pixelization and almost a destruction of the image, which looks quite beautiful. In this case over here, this is an in-camera nine exposure, multiple exposure. So nine exposures on top of each other. A couple are in focus, a couple are out focus, one or two of the textures that surround you, and it's all shot in camera, and the effect that you get usually doesn't work, but every now and then it does. So if I go in closer, you will see how beautiful this art impression starts to come because the camera was unable to stitch the image together correctly. This you could do in Photoshop as well. So in this case, you take a whole lot of photographs of the same scene, but slightly different perspectives, slightly different exposures, and then you can combine them in this case in layers in Photoshop. And the impression that you start to get is that sort of thing. Now, seen big and printed on the wall, it, it is just phenomenal. Photographs are not meant to be on a computer screen, they're meant to be real. And there's texture, which you can see as well, which has come through quite nicely. Yeah, I, really, I really love that, um, really love that look uh, with the, the sort of multiple layers on uh, yes. uh, the images. It's, it's just, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it reminds, it's, it's, for me, it's all just sort of memories and, and uh, you know, uh, it's difficult for me to put into words, but it's, it's, it's got a very warm and welcoming uh, type of yes. uh, feel. Cool. I'm glad you like it. I would be worried if you didn't. <laughs> so, pop art, just using Photoshop, use and saturations. This is the hand painting of black and white photographs. So here you, um, you would take an inkjet print on the, this, there's a certain type of paper that you can use. We print it out quite lightly onto the inkjet so you have a reference. And then you hand paint it using uh, photographic, uh, well not photographic paint, sorry. You, you can use, um, watercolors, you can use acrylics, you can use charcoals, and you start to hand paint back the impression. And if I go in close, look at the authenticity of, of the actual finalized image. And again, when this is seen big enough on the wall, it looks 10 times better than what I'm showing you now. Here's a, here's a digitally created photo montage, uh, in this case, built into different blocks, but we do these by hand as well created by hand and then we photograph them. This is what we call a nitro transfer. So here we're taking a black powder ink and we're transferring it using thinners or we're transferring it using acetone onto an art medium. And it, it again creates a charcoal type impression. This is combining straightforward photography with mobile photography. So using apps and that on mobile where you create layers and you're able to bring them back to your original photograph. This is a, a print I've just finished for an exhibition we've uh, had at the end of uh, last year. And uh, this is called Creation, and this is uh, my lowest edition to date, and, uh, and also my highest priced uh, print to date. So there's a series of four or five of these pictures, and I am so pleased to see some of them hanging in some beautiful spaces. And uh, yeah, it just gives a person a great feeling. 
So this is uh, done in, in um, uh, it almost the feeling of creation and how it must have felt when the earth was created and the energy and, the, and that type of thing. It's very artistic. I'm not going to go down that road. Uh, let's leave it for there at the moment. This is another example of, of, of where you, one uses this, the, the impression to tell the story. So this is the relationship between organic material above the ground versus organic material below. Um, so here the plant life versus the, what happens underground. I'm a great, great fan of Jackson Pollock. So this is my tribute to Jackson Pollock. And it's the unseen underground that supports the top and vice versa. This is the type of feel that you get when you look at the, the final print. This is an abstract photograph, which is built up out of the photographs taken from the underside of fishing boats. And in this case, they've been put together to look like a little Dutch harbor with some towers and a nice wintry sky above. You're going to find this quite difficult to believe, or hopefully you don't, but I've often asked the question, what is your number one selling print in the gallery? Well, this is number two. So there is such an appetite for abstract photography. And I've always said I'm a painter trapped in photography. And uh, this is actually where I'm sitting at the moment. This is the mountains behind me in, in Hout Bay with a fiery sky being put together as a photo montage. This is one of my latest works. I did the Candy Girls. I finished her and her sister. And these are hand-painted black and white photographs with 3D overlays. So if you go in close, the rubber bands are actually real, and the juxtaposition is the, is the hand-painted black, black and white now in color in the background. Also multiple exposures, nine exposures on top of each other, including the sun and textures of the, of the ground. A series called Rhythmus, a very good example of decorative art. This, this, this photograph has done well for me, one of my all-time heroes and absolute icons. I did a, a portrait in celebration of him. This is a charcoal uh, transfer, which was hand embellished. And then I, I, the theme is salt of the earth. And there's a, there's a nice video on this. So if the guys go onto the YouTube channel, they can watch the, the video behind the creating of this picture if you're interested. But what it is, is, is salt crystals that have been thrown over the nitro transfer in order to create the shadows and highlights on the actual picture. Um, it's called Salt of the Earth and there's a whole story behind it, but you have to go and watch the video to see that. There's another example called Face the Society, questioning leaders in society and the posters that are on the, the walls. Straightforward photograph, desaturated, and I had exhibitions all over the world with this, which I'm so excited about. That includes Nelson Mandela, the boxer. Found this in Hillbrow, of all places. To, to finalize the presentation and what I'm trying to say, a camera, in my opinion, is considered as only part of a creative process. It's only part of a creative process. One of the tools on the workbench of art, and it brings a whole lot of things with it to the party. Art photography embraces imperfection. If you do not understand this, or you do not try to understand this, art photography for you forever and a day will remain a mystery and will remain something that you're gonna to battle to understand. It embraces imperfection. Art is not about perfect. And lastly, creativity cannot be defined. It can only be explored. And one needs to understand that as well. So just uh, to finish off, this is where I'm sitting at the moment. I'm sitting in our, our home gallery. This is my private space, which I share with Samantha. Um, and we have often have exhibition openings here, and it's a fun place to be. This is the outside of the gallery, so we have a wonderful view. We're very blessed to look over, over um, onto Chapman's Peak in the bay. It certainly beats Centurion. I'm sorry, Quentin, but I used to live very close to you in Red House Paddock North, or East Kral, Nuit, and uh, this certainly beats that. So this is the actual private gallery, and this is the art photography gallery in Greenpoint. Uh, this is the one we're currently busy moving. And I think while we take questions, I'm gonna leave this on the screen, but this is where we're moving to. We feel very blessed because it's the Amen building, 1900 Amen building. So that was a joke. You see, this is where I miss an audience because some people would laugh and some people would walk out and at least you get a reaction. But that's where we're moving to. Um, and we are currently uh, about to start shop fitting. The whole building has been re-renovated. And it's a, a beautiful area of Woodstock 
quite close to the, or just, a, just about across the road from the Goodman Gallery, a block away from Stevenson Gallery, a block and a half away from um, a whole lot of galleries, including SMAC, the big uh, uh, young gallery that's opened there. So we are going to be in the hub of all of these gallery spaces. We are going to be showcasing what photography can do in the world of art. So I've put up all our little handles, uh, photo school as well as uh, the gallery itself. So I'd really appreciate if people would, wouldn't mind following us and do all the things that youngsters understand that's important for social yeah. media marketing. Hitting uh, oh. like, subscribe, uh, ring in the bell, etc. Et yeah, yeah, yeah those, those things. <laughs> so, so maybe, I don't know. We left enough time for questions, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, if if Samantha could put um, the the link to that video that you had mentioned, um, if she could put that in the the comments, that'd be great. Um, so then people can go and have a look All at right, we'll do that. of how that was done. But then um, I. The I've got a question okay, about the, um, uh, so, so your, your, your process, do you have a process? Do you kind of say, well, um, right, today I'm going to go out and, and photograph trees in a field or, or, or do you just go out and, 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 and shoot stuff? I suppose specifically yeah. with the, the landscape uh, fine arts. I think that's, that's a very good question. Um, yes to year, yes, I would make that decision. But I've realized today that, that everything is a subject for me. In fact, my portfolio is so varied. At one stage, I thought that it was, it was to my detriment. And I called in um, Sean O'Toole, the, art, the great art critic, South Africa, well-known South yes. African art critic, to, to help me in my, in my journey. And after looking at my portfolio a few weeks later, he came back and he said to me, you know what, you must carry on with the way you're going because your work reminds me of a sweet shop. When you walk into a sweet shop and you see licorice all sorts here and suckers over there and candy there, he said, that's what my work reminds him of and I need to stay with the variety. Now, in order to do that, everything is a subject to me. So, so I do have ideas of what I want to photograph based on when the lighting will be correct. So I've got a short list that I'd like to visit. And, uh, and depending on the month, the year, and the angle of the light, if it's landscape photography, then I will go out specifically at that time and try to get what I'm looking for. But generally in the world of art photography, you know, anything goes. You wake up in the mood that this is what you want to create, something inspires you, and suddenly it's all there. So I think if, if, if I did that, I, I would put blinkers on and I would miss so much more. So in Martin's little world, I'm working on 30 projects all at the same time. And, uh, and that's about as much multitasking as I can do. Okay. So I, I think in, in, my, um, in my sort of phase or, or career, I'm still in the technical part where the ISO has to be as low as possible. It has to be absolutely in focus uh, and those sorts of things. And I, I, I struggle with, uh, you know, uh, taking it anywhere, anywhere else. And I think that, um, you know, the, this type of uh, presentation, certainly for me, um, is something that, uh, that, that, you know, hopefully will have some sort of a nudge into just freeing up the, uh, you know, the creativity that's there within those uh, sort of technical boundaries. Um, mm. I mean, yes. just the thought of, um, of, of doing HDR in camera um, handheld when something is moving. I mean, I would, yes. you know, I can't even think of, of doing that, but, you know, just seeing the explanation of, of that uh, is fascinating. I actually can't believe that, um, that that's how it was done. You know, yeah. okay. Are well, you still seeing my screen? Um, yeah, there's two of us now. I'll put you next to me there. Oh, good. Okay, cool. All right, that's great. That's great. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it's and remember, this type of photography is not for everybody. Okay. I mean, let's let's be quite frank. Okay. It's it's not for everybody. I I know of many photographers who just like the fact of being in photography for the fact of being able to hold a piece of equipment. And I'm not joking. Some mm. people just like to take out a camera and hold it. If they take no pictures, it just makes them feel good. Okay. Um, other people just, just love the, the challenge of being able to photograph things in a certain way. And we can't take that away from people. So I, I don't want this talk to be, this is the way you should be doing it, or this is what you should be doing. That's a choice. Uh, that's a choice and and you know for me it's I've, I've said I'm, I'm a photographer trapped in a in a painter's body so for me this was an absolute release that I was looking for 
and uh, and that's what I enjoy. Are you okay? Well, at at the end of the day, you know, I, sp I suppose it's uh, part of it is all about what the options are. You know, the, you can go purely technical. Uh, you I can guess. go, you know, etc. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's part of the reason for for having uh, as as diverse an audience or as diverse a presentation or presenter set that I can, because yes. people may not right. have, uh, you know, be thinking about. It. I mean, for me, I, as I, I said, that the HDR handheld. Um, while things are moving, I would never have thought of that. But seeing that, it's like, okay, I've got to try that. Um, you know, and that's, that's, that's uh, you know, for me, it's like a, a release. I mean, I think one of the things, and I've said it in one of the previous presentations, being, being a professional photographer, your, your mm. camera is, is, is a work tool. So I, I do very little, um, uh, you know, personal stuff just because I have to yes. process it and, and then I've got to select that yes. and, you know, um, but yes. possibly this, this could be, you know, uh, the, 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 the antidotes uh, to that. So um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe keep me a little bit more sane. Um, I, I do have a question here from Tony Leroy. Um, can yes. any photographer make uh, the transition from 100% technical to good fine art? Don't know. Um, sorry, who asked the question? Um, it's, Tony. it's Tony Leroy, yeah. Okay, Tony. Yeah, very difficult question to answer. Um, I think I think it's it all is based on a person's personality, their wants, their desires, their needs. Um, I, I would never say anybody. I, I must say that that a lot of people have come and done. Um, I do a, a week, not just a week. I do I do a fine art photography course, and some people who come on the course leave at the end of the day, not intending to continue down the road. But what they do say is that it's released them from technical photography, that they're not so scared anymore. And they're actually embracing mistakes rather than, than, than becoming scared of them. So, so I think a, a difficult question to answer. I, I'm, I'm sure it's possible depending on a person's wants, desires, needs, and whether they're professional or not. Um, too, too difficult question to answer. So, so my, my question based on that one, because um, obviously, yeah. for me, photography is is a, a, a means of, of it's a creative outlet, but it's also a means of supporting uh, my family. Yes. If I decide, yeah. right, I'm going full on uh, fine artist. Um, yes. There's there's obviously there's 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 in, inherent talents that you need to have and an eye, etc. But yeah. I would assume that there's also a period of time where you need to uh, uh, nurture your audience who's going to be mm -hmm. buying the work so that you I can agree. make a living from it. Absolutely. So let, let's, let me first say this, <laughs> just like you, I also make a living from what I do. So, uh, so it's, it's just a little bit different. Uh, yeah. I'm putting my heart and soul on the wall for people to, to look at and to offer the opinion whether I like it or not. And the only way I know that I'm going down the right track is when somebody invests in a piece. Absolutely. The second point is that in order to be successful in the world of art as an artist per se, it's not necessarily about what you create. It's about your name. So most of the career is built building a name in the world of the art circles. Yes, there's certain people who happen to be in the right family and they happen to be, have celebrities as friends or family and whatever it is, and, and they're able to get a, a push up a lot quicker. But for most of us, it requires building it. So this is, this is not a quick fix. This is a long walk to freedom. And it takes, it's a lifetime passion. It's a, somebody asked me the other day, do I have a, it's a career, they said it as an artist. You know, it's not a career. It's a calling. It's, a, it's what I do every day to give me joy, but I happen to be able to make a living from it. And every year it gets easier and easier as you build an audience. So yes, it's not about, Necessarily, what you're photographing, it's got more to do with with you know, the, what you are creating as an artist and a following that people are enjoying in what you're doing. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. So definitely, the, it's the same as with everything. You know, you need to put in the time um, and uh, yes. and the effort, and, and it does eventually pay off. Um, Correct. I was I was at a, a, a doing an exhibition in London many years back, and my young sorry, my eldest son was with me. And uh, we, the, the exhibition opened, it's a quick story, so the exhibition opened and nobody turned up. And I was so sad. And I stood there and then suddenly a car pulled up and somebody jumped out, they looked inside, didn't like what they saw, out they went and gone. 
at the same night, 37 exhibitions were opening in London and I felt like the world was on my shoulders. And Matthew turned to me and said, don't worry, Dad, one day when you're dead, you'll be famous. <laughs> and, you know, I felt like I wanted to hit him, but it's actually true. Well, the good news is the exhibition eventually went really well, um, but that took a while to get to catch a light. But it, it, it's still, it's right. That's what it is. It's a calling. So it's a calling during a lifetime. Um, and then I've got a, a question from uh, Melinda Collins. Um, once you started and created the artwork, how do you go about finding uh, exhibition space or something similar? Obviously, you've got a gallery, um, but let's say you, you, know, you, you, you don't have that. How would you go about uh, finding the space? Yeah, very good question, Melinda. I think, I think here yeah, what's important to understand is, is that one needs to find a gallery that is suitable where they will showcase your type of work because that's more or less what they're offering to their clientele. So where people go wrong is, and we see it because we get a lot of people making um, submissions to our gallery, we get this portfolio of 10,000 images. I call it the one hit one. It's one brilliant picture and the rest, I don't even know what it's doing there. And you tend to find because of that, uh, people are unsuccessful. The ones who are successful are those who take a body of work, they put together six, seven, eight images, they all have meaning, they connect with one another, and there's artistic explanations, both visually and behind the scenes, with a full description, artist biography, uh, artist statement, everything that comes with it, and that a gallerist can look at and say, you know what, I can take that and put it on the wall, I don't have too much work to do, and it's the type of work I'd like to show. So one has to present correctly, so, and I think we tend to, to try to present too much too quickly and if you keep it if you and I would actually ask for opinion before I actually submit I think that's also important and don't ask opinion from families families have got no idea how good or how bad you are families are only there to I've really said the wrong thing but yeah easy they're only easy there to hold you and yeah, they, they are there for that show it to public who don't know you from anything and ask them what they think they will tell you the truth they're the ultimate critic in the world of art yeah, I think it's a good point uh, that you mentioned about, um, you know, being uh, presenting to the right audience. Um, because if you, you know, if, you, if you're putting a, a, a red square on a white background and, and the audience that you're looking for is a, is a more painterly impressionist, it's, it's, it's never going to work. Um, you know, so I think that, uh, you know, having the people that, that are, are, are going to be representing you, be it at gallery, etc., you know, it's got to be the right fit. It has, it, it, it has, and it, it, the presentation and the way it comes across needs to be professional. They see too many, uh, they see far too many applications. It's got to stand out. It really does. So uh, yeah, I can, uh, yeah, I can confess to that because I've also got some galleries overseas that show my work. So I have to go through the same process as well. Okay, well, I think we've got uh, probably about a minute left. So um, I just want to wrap it up and say thank you very much, uh, Martin, for showing us your, your perspective. I there's one or two comments here that, uh, that are saying how, how you know, it's, it's a nice, refreshing uh, perspective, a different perspective um, yes. you know, from what we've seen so far. Now, that's really what I wanted to try and get across is the, you know, the, the diversity and all of that. So thank you very much for, for presenting your, your work. It was fantastic. Really great to chat to you. And um, if you if you wouldn't mind on the comments, you and Sam can can go and uh, you know reply to some of them, etc. And um, make sure that you put your links in there as well to the gallery and and work, etc. So yeah, we'll do that. thank you very much. Right. Really appreciate it. Have a fantastic day. Absolute right. pleasure. God bless. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.